بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مصطفى 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 يا مصطفى يا مصطفى يا مصطفى ceremony is very simple. The marriage ceremony is simply a, it's a contract between two people. It's a legal binding contract. And as any contract goes, it has to have certain uh, components, certain ingredients. Must have an offer and an acceptance. Hijab and Qabul. That is an essential part of marriage or any contract. You offer something and the other person accepts. The second part of marriage is this. Okay. It's all right. It's all right. It doesn't matter. Okay. The second part of a marriage contract is there must be witnesses. Oops. Sorry. And for an Islamic contract of marriage, there must be two male witnesses. If you have one female witness, then there must be two female witnesses to replace each male witness. Why now that's is that? Why do they have two female witnesses? Yeah, I'm just going to explain. There's two reasons for this, alright? One is to ensure that there is a decent separation between men and women. If you have one man and one woman witnessing something, it's not very nice, so better to have two women. The second reason is this, if, if it comes to litigation, if it comes to uh, a challenge of the contract, it's better for the women if they're challenged as a group rather than as individuals. So to protect the one woman's integrity, another woman is brought in place as well. And that, 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 those are the reasons. Otherwise, if it comes to a challenging to the contract, a judge or a lawyer might then question the woman's integrity. But if there are two women, it's more difficult. So they are protectors of each other. That's the reason. If a man's insulted or ridiculed, it doesn't matter. And that's why there are two witnesses. It's for protecting of the woman, not to say she's you know, worth half of the man. That's not the reason. The third ingredient of a marriage ceremony is it must be a gift or mahar. The gift must go from the bridegroom to the bride. <coughs> now, the gift is not specified. The best way to understand what the gift is, is whatever is expected for the standing of the family and what the community regards as acceptable. All right? So in a poor area, the gift might be you know, a, a, a few items of clothing. For a, a wealthy area, a wealthy community might be you know, a house. There is nothing specified. Is it compulsory? The woman has to agree the gift. It's part of the contract. If you don't agree the gift, there's no marriage. The gift doesn't have to be given straight away, it can be promised. So a, a woman might ask for, say, you know, 10,000 pounds. The husband can't pay, he has to promise it. So if he initiates divorce, then he has to pay that 10,000 pounds to her. If she initiates divorce, 
she has to give the mahar back. Those are sort of very general, very basic rules. So the gift is quite important. It's really there to protect the woman in case of divorce. You can understand it like that. The witnesses are there to confirm the marriage took place and the offer as the acceptance is part of the legal contract. And also this ensures that the woman and the man have both agreed to the marriage. Now, there's something called forced marriages. There is no such thing as forced marriages in Islam. However, there is such a thing in the correct environment whereby people are married before the age of puberty. That is permissible. When once they reach the age of adulthood, then they should be asked, is this marriage acceptable to you? That's like an engagement. Now people regard that as a marriage, actually that's an engagement. It can only be confirmed once people reach of the right age and then they say, yeah, that's acceptable. Because in farming communities of the past, marriage was not such a great issue. You got married one day, next day you carried on with your life, farming the land. It wasn't a big issue. Now it's become a big issue. Now everyone's extremely choosy and you have to have, you know, uh, ceremonies and functions and all this. So it's now become a little bit complicated. And there's a lot of family politics involved like this. So where there is marriage without permission of the children, that is only before the age of adulthood. Once they reach the age of adulthood, their permission is required. And if they are married, or they're forced to marry and live with each other, if they go to an, uh, a Qazi or an Alim, and the Alim says, were you asked, did you ever w were asked about this marriage? And the girl says, no I wasn't, the marriage is automatically annulled. So permission is required in the Islamic contract. Now how is that permission obtained? There are two ways it's obtained. One is, the girl can choose a veli. She can choose a guardian. Usually her father, her uncle, her brother, whatever. That guardian is then asked, is she happy with this marriage? And the guardian says, yes, she is. Or the alim can become her veli. The alim can go and ask her, do you, are you happy with this marriage proposal? Are you, do you allow me to arrange a marriage with this man? And if she says yes, then that is acceptable. So there are a couple of ways of doing this. What I normally do is actually ask the girl myself in front of the witnesses. Because people don't understand the position of the veli and all this, they don't know what to say. And also, you know, in this modern age, we, girls are not of that shyness that they can't speak for themselves. However, if a girl is silent, even now, if a girl is silent when she's asked, that is a yes. Right, so if you don't want to marry someone, trust me, you should say no. Right? But by that time, you know, everything's settled, everyone's happy, and you paid a lot of money for the hall and everything, it's not going to happen. But if you say no, the alim is duty-bound not to marry you. If you keep quiet, it's a yes. And you ask normally three times. For example, the wording might be, do you, sister Lubna Bashir, take a daughter of um, Ahmad Bashir, take Imran Ali Muhammad, son of uh, Yaqub Muhammad, as your uh, Islamic husband? And you say yes. Or you can be asked, do you allow me to arrange a marriage with this person, son of so-and-so? And you say yes. And you normally ask three times. Remember, these rules can vary depending upon the environment. If the environment is such that there is a tremendous separation between men and women, then the veli is appointed. If it's not, like in, in times now which we have, then you know, it's a little bit different. So the rules of Islam are flexible enough to accommodate different types of environment. That's forced marriages. That's nikah and that's forced marriages. And I've actually completed the whole topic of marriage. All right. Because the marriage ceremony is quite simple, and that question, that, the answer to that question is also quite simple. <coughs> okay, actually. 
Who do you look for in the marriage, part, as a marriage partner? What do you look for? Very important. There are three qualities you must look for. And each one is important. Anyone tell me what they are? Dean? Okay, any others? Okay, none of you will say this, I'll say it. Looks. Right. <laughs> Knowledge. Knowledge. Anything else? Financial. Knowledge. Crikey. Finances. That's not free. Okay, any, anything else? Personality. Personality. Yeah. Anything else? You're missing one. Family. Yeah. Anything else? Age, yes. Yeah, Muslim comes in that, Dean. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. The most important of these, all right, the most important one is this one, Takwa. How God conscious is that person? For some reason, people have the impression the greater, the more the religious a person is, the more oppressive the person is. All right, that is true for ignorant religious people. It's not true for intelligent uh, religious people. Taqwa is your first priority. If the person doesn't achieve that uh, level of taqwa then you should reject the person straight away. Never think you can change a person. If you can change a person, he can change before marriage. Have that, have that condition or rule. Fine. If he's desperate to marry you, say, well, fine, you'll change yourself. Start praying five times. Give up smoking. Give up drinking. Give up drugs. If he says he'll do that after marriage, why can't he do that before marriage? That's the test. Any marriage not based on taqwa, is doomed to be difficult and fail. Any marriage based on taqwa, no matter what the other problems are, it will be successful because the taqwa will overcome the problems. The second most important thing, so that's number one, all right? The second most important thing is looks. <coughs> Unless you're blind, right? <laughs> looks are important because Looks determine the happiness between yourselves, the romance, the attraction, and that must exist in the marriage. <coughs> Ultimately, you know, you're going to end up most of your life looking at the person you married. Right? So that is important. The third most important thing is a family. The family line, the genealogy, is a family of noble background. Is it a decent family in history? Have they a good place in the community? Are they well respected? Are they reasonably simple? Do they keep themselves to themselves? What sort of family is it? Is it a family a lot of politics? These three things are the most important. After that, all the other things come in. For example, in taqwa, knowledge comes in, personality comes in. But in the hadith of Prophet وسلم, these three are the most important. If a person marries for looks, you'll get the looks. You may not get the taqwa. As I advised one young sister who was marrying this guy who looked like a movie star. All right? I said to her, look, fine, he might want to marry you today, but you know, next week, another girl will go after him. How do you feel about that? Because you're looking at this. I said, look at that first. Look at taqwa first. If taqwa is good, then that won't be a problem. Yeah. And then the same goes the other way around. The boys try to look at all this as well in marriage. The first thing is taqwa. And again, I say to young men who want to get married, say, I want a sister with hijab. I say, that's fine. But if she says to you, I'll wear hijab after marriage, say, what's the problem? Why can't you wear before marriage? 
because oh, I found that to be a problem with some, some marriages. Or, the, or parents say to boys, oh, shave your beard off now, get married and grow your beard afterwards. <laughs> I don't understand what the difficulty is. The problem we've got is that it's perceived, a religious person is perceived to be a difficult person or is perceived to be a backward person or an ignorant person. That is because we haven't trained our ulama properly. And most of our ulama are okay. Unfortunately, some religious people are very ignorant. <coughs> but similarly, those who are non-religious, also many of them are ignorant as well. I've got to say this as well. This world is a very, very bad place to live in at the moment. You can describe it as a brothel, this world. That's how it is. It's a very dirty, dangerous world. So that's why that becomes very important. Okay. Okay, if you want to marry someone against your parents' choice, can you do so? Right. My advice is you shouldn't do that. Okay? In the strictest sense, in the strictest sense, you have to marry that person which you like. Alright? It doesn't mean go against your parents' wishes, it means you should come to an agreement. Because you marry into a family and that person marries into a family. You are creating problems for yourself. Alright? However, if you can persuade your parents in a mature way, in a sensible way, and give them your reasons, and they'll give you your, their reasons, then you can discuss it maturely. That will have a very good effect. Because one thing about parents is they've got the experience which you haven't. Think about it. Say you've been married for 20, 20, 10 or 20 years. Surely you can advise someone in a much better way than you haven't been married at all. Similarly, they are in such a position, they can advise you. They can see the future. They can see beyond the looks, beyond the romance, beyond the honeymoon. They can see all that. End of the day, when you're living life, you're living life and it's a burden, it's a struggle. And looks won't keep you together in the struggle, nor will money. But taqwa will keep you together. Taqwa, character compatibility, these things will keep you together. And your parents have a very important part to play in that. Also, strictly speaking, in some families, it's not allowed for children to go against the wishes of their parents. Because of the nature of the family. So just be very careful with that. Better you try and persuade your parents maturely and sensibly, and you'll find them, inshallah, to be listening to you as well. Okay, another question, same question. They are duty bound to find a good partner for you, whether it's in the family or outside the family. Usually it's easier to find inside the extended family, but it's not essential. But again, the choice is down to you. They can't force you and you can't force them. You have to come to an understanding. I know it's very difficult, but each situation must be judged separately. You are not allowed to marry women, Muslim women are not allowed to marry Hindu or Christian. It, no matter how much the Hindu or Christian respects the Muslim faith, it's not allowed in Islam. A Muslim man cannot marry a non-Muslim woman except in two cases, a Jewish woman and a Christian woman, on condition that these people believe in Tawheed. And number two, they have tremendous love and respect for Islam, so much so they might become Muslims. But if there are Muslim women available, I would, not, uh, I would recommend a Muslim man should not marry uh, non-Muslim women. Okay, in such a case, the marriage is not acceptable in Sharia. In such a case, the marriage, 
If you come a bit closer, a bit easier. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In such a case, the marriage is not uh, uh, seen as marriage in Sharia. It's not seen as marriage, actually seen living together in sin. Do you have to marry? The Prophet said, "Sallallahu sunnati." Nikah is my sunnah. If you don't follow my sunnah, you're not part of me. I think that answers that question. We are created for marriage, and marriage serves one purpose to raise a family. And that is why we get married. Don't think about too much about you know love and romance and all, all that's very nice, alright? And if you have that, alhamdulillah, most of you will have that inshallah. But ultimately, the burden of life is that we raise decent children in this environment. And that is why we marry. Okay, another question about parents insisting. Uh, my advice is the same. Try and persuade parents maturely and parents, I say, try and persuade your children maturely. I'll give an example. There was one sister, she wanted to marry this man. The parents didn't like him. They wanted her to marry in the family. So I asked her, I said, why don't, you, why don't you speak to your parents and ask them what objections they have? And they should ask you what objections you have about this boy. And then discuss it like that. And when they actually discuss what objections they were, then they realize actually the boys weren't too bad. And then they came to an agreement. It's a bit of a political game, but unfortunately sometimes it has to be played. Oh dear, same question. <coughs> Alright, don't worry, I'll get on, on to this. Okay. Okay, it, very, very good question this. You are married, you have children, your husband marries again with someone else. It's a very uh, difficult question to answer that. All I can say is when husbands come to me and advise, ask me, can I, can I marry someone else? I say, look, you are permitted to. It's permissible. But in this culture, it's not advisable.